Hello there. Welcome back. I'm Martin, and today on Taddy Rolled of One, I'm going to be talking about role-playing game box sets. That's for system, for settings, for supplements, or for adventures that were published in a, in a box set format by TSR between the years 1974 and 1988. Now, if you know a little bit about TSR history, especially in the 90s, you'll know why I'm not going to cover that period of time. It's because they published so many different box sets during that time period that this video would probably be about three times longer than it already is if I were to include just that short period of time from 1989 until 1997 when TSR was acquired by Wizards of the Coast. So just as an example, just in the year 1989 and for the game Dungeons & Dragons alone, so not even all the other role-playing games that they were also publishing, but just for D&D alone, they published five box sets just in 1989. So that'll give you kind of a, an example of like why I'm not covering those years. However, if you are interested in some of those box sets from the 90s or in, in you know, starting in 89, uh, leave a comment below and let me know if you'd like me to cover that time period. And I'll, and I'll see if I can add it to the uh the to-do list of the videos coming up. And also, if there are any of these box sets I'm going to cover today that you want more information on, because I'm going to have to go through these very, very quickly. I'm not going to get into a lot of things like mechanics and things like that, because I just don't have time in this video. So if you want more details on any of these, drop a comment below and let me know, and I'll see if I can get to it in a future video. Okay, so some ground rules here. Uh, I'm only going to be talking about box sets for role-playing games that were published by TSR. So there were other companies that published box sets, but I'm not going to be talking about those. I'm only talking about TSR. It's not that I don't know those exist. I'm just only talking about TSR. I'm only going to be talking about role-playing game box sets. So TSR did publish a lot of box sets for board games and for war games. And sometimes it can be hard to tell the 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 differences in the terminology gets a little bit muddy. So as an example, in 1975, TSR published two box sets that were related to the Empire of the Petal Throne setting. So one was called Empire of the Petal Throne. It is um, a box set role-playing game. And uh, the other one is was called War of Wizards. Okay, and you will see sites online, like websites that will describe War of Wizards as a box set role-playing game. It is not. It is a board game. And when you read what the mechanics were like and how the play worked, it's very clearly, it's very clear you can understand that, that was not a role playing game. So sometimes the terminology, even online from people that sell these games, it gets a little bit muddied. So if I skip over something that you think uh, I should have included, you know, before you try to hit me with a gotcha in the comments, just double check that it really was a role playing game, not a board game or a war game. Okay. But if I did skip it, yeah, please leave a note in the comments. Just, you know, be cool about it. All right. So with that, I'm going to start out by breaking one of the rules that I just stated, which is that this original game for Dungeons and Dragons published in 1974 was not published by TSR. It was actually published by Tactical Studies Rules, okay, which is the precursor company to TSR. So um, really quick, this, okay, so this is a much later edition. If you see here, it says original collector's edition. So the original version, it's the same size, but it was covered in this uh, paper that looked like faux wood grain. And they actually, uh, Don Kay and Gary Gygax, and uh, there was another gentleman that was helping them out. And I'm going to get to him later. Um, but they were wrapping um, the paper kind of like themselves around these boxes. They made a thousand copies. They're extremely hard to come by now when you do see one come up for sale. Those original wood grain box sets. Um, they go for thousands of dollars. And so sometimes I'll see people in their videos and they'll show how many of those that they've acquired and kept over the years on their shelves. And, you know, it's bragging. I guess it's cool to show that off. But I would love for those to be in a maybe a library or a setting where they could be, um, you know, first kept care of, but also, you know, documented where people could go and kind of look at them and see what it actually looked like rather than somebody hoarding like five copies of them. But that's just me. Okay, so I'm going to also talk about through this video, a little bit of my personal connection to some of these and why I have them in my collection. Just one to help you guys get to know me better. Um, you've all been super grateful about, um, you know, just supporting this channel. And so I kind of wanted you to know a little bit more about like why I have some of these. And so I'm going to start off by talking about this one. My mom gave this to me in the late 90s. It might have even been very, very early 2000s, like 2000 the year 2000, maybe 2001, but I think it was earlier than that. Um, 
And she went to uh, the local game store that I used to frequent when I was visiting her and my dad. The game store was located in Diamond Bar. It was the closest one to her. It was called All Star Games. And I used to go there a lot in the 90s um, to buy mostly um, Warhammer 40k miniatures and Magic the Gathering cards, to be honest. But the people at the shop knew me. They knew I played role playing games. So my mom went in and talked to them and said she was buying me a birthday gift. And did they have something that... um, that might work. And so, and she wanted something that like, I wouldn't necessarily think of getting myself. She wanted to make sure she wasn't going to buy me something that I already had. And so uh, they recommended this to her. So just as kind of a fun aside, the person that she talked to, if you're familiar with the, the game company, all direct entertainment group or AEG, they're kind of most famous, I would say for probably legends of the five rings um, and uh, seven seas, the role-playing games. So, uh, and Legend of Thrive Rings eventually does get acquired by Wizards of the Coast, and they strike a deal to use the setting from that Rokugan in their third edition um, Oriental Adventures book. And so uh, anyway, a guy that worked at that company, his name's Jim Pinto, and I think he might even still work there. But Jim and I actually went to college together and but didn't know it. I just I remember very specifically seeing him in like our cafeteria where we ate, ate lunch. Um, playing D and D or other role playing games with his friends at a table, and I just didn't know him, and you know, was kind of an introvert, so I didn't go up and approach him and introduce myself. But years later, I'm shopping at the store where he works at, and um, you know, we realized that we went to college together. Anyway, so he recommended this to my mom, and she picked it up. Now I have what is known in the industry kind of as a Frankenstein box set because this original box set came with three booklets. And my second booklet, which is this one, Monsters and Treasure, is a different printing. And you can tell that very clearly because it just has a different color. It's a little bit lighter than these other two. So when they sold this to my mom, they did tell her. They said, this book is missing. Um, and so they threw in a copy of Chainmail instead. This is the seventh printing of Chainmail. And so they threw it in and they said, we'll keep a lookout for this book if you want us to. And she said, yes. And it, what's super cool is it took like years, but it was like maybe two, three years later. Um uh, they found a copy of this and they did call my mom and say, Hey, we found this. Do you still want it? And she said, yes, I, I would like that. And so she went in and picked it up. And so I stuck it in my box set. So it's just, I have a mismatched set of printings, but you know, otherwise the content's pretty much the same, but this is 1974. Okay. So let's go to 1975. This is the only box set that is published in 1974, 1975, early 75, uh, tactical stage rules is disbanded. Um, unfortunately, Don K, one of the founders, he died and they um, eventually buy his wife out and um, they uh, create a new company called TSR Inc. OK, or TSR Hobbies. So TSR Hobbies then publishes this game in 1975, Empire of the Petal Throne. I have a whole video about this game already, so I'm not even going to really touch on this too much. But this is a box set role playing game published by TSR in 1975. Okay, another game that TSR publishes in 1975 is this one, Fight in the Skies. So this is kind of breaking my rule also on only talking about role-playing games. Fight in the Skies is a tactical board game of World War I aerial combat. Now, it was originally published in 1966. It was self-published by its creator, a man named Mike Carr. His name is going to come up later. So Mike Carr meets Gary Gygax in, I want to say 1968, I believe it was, at like a Gen Con tournament um, where Mike Carr was kind of debuting and showing off this Fight in the Skies game that he created. And uh, later, uh, Fight in the Skies is then published by Guidon Games, 1972. Now, Guidon Games was the original publisher of the Chainmail Supplement. I just showed that earlier. But before Tactical Stays Rules existed, Chainmail was published by a company called Guidon Games. And Guidon Games also publishes Mike Carr's uh, Fight in the Skies. So they take it over. And then um, later, Mike Carr works with Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson to write a game called Don't Give Up the Ship. OK, so he has a connection with these people and eventually um, they take over. TSR takes over publishing Fight in the Sky. So this is the first TSR edition, although it's technically the fifth edition of Fight in the Skies. So this is 1975 uh, published by TSR. OK, then in 1976, you don't have any uh, other box sets published by TSR. This is, I think, going to be the only year where we don't have a box set 
published by TSR in 1970, uh, which is 1976. Okay. Then in 1977, you have the release of the Holmes basic D and D set. So if you're not familiar with all these different editions of D and D, because they do start to get kind of confusing, please watch my video on the history of D and D editions. And I start to outline the differences between original and then what kind of became known colloquially as the basic line, although it was technically just called Dungeons and Dragons. And it was this completely separate game from advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. But 1977, you have this Holmes basic set. Now, it was called Holmes Basic because it is edited by a man named uh, Eric J. Holmes, and he was a professor of neurology. And he wrote to TSR in uh, hoping he wanted to help edit the game to help it appeal more to younger players. So as opposed to the college players and the war gamers who are currently playing, he thought that it could appeal to younger players as young as, say, 10 years old. And so he wrote to them with this idea to kind of help expand the market for D&D. And they agreed. They said, yeah, that's a great idea. And so they hired him to edit the game to make the rules, not change the rules, but make the explanation of the rules simpler to understand. So he takes the original D&D set. He adds the thief class from um, Greyhawk Supplement 1, and he coalesces that all into the Dungeons and Dragons basic set from 1977. Now, originally this box set, in addition to the rule book, it did uh, have dice sometimes. Sometimes it had chits. There's a whole story about this, but uh, there was a dice shortage at TSR at a certain point. And so sometimes the set was published with chits instead of dice. Okay. Um, but it also had originally Dungeon Geomorphs set one, and then Monster and Treasure Assortment set one, which was levels one through three. And that was for dungeon masters to help stock their dungeons. That's how you used to do it back then was you'd use these types of products. However, later in 1978, the fourth printing adds this module. This is B1 uh, in Search of the Unknown by Mike Carr. So we've already talked about him, but he writes this module, which then gets included in the basic set moving forward. Now, one of the interesting things that happens when this module is put into the basic set instead of the Dungeon Geomorphs and the Monster and Treasure uh, assortment is that Mike Carr, the author of this module, he starts to get um, royalties from this being printed. And distributed in the 1977 basic set. And that 1977 basic set sold like, um, let's say it sold like gangbusters, foreshadowing. Anyway, uh, so he starts to collect royalties from that. And Gary Gygax sees that and realizes that he could get more royalties than he was already getting. So he and Dave Arneson were splitting royalties on the basic set because they were with the original creators of Dungeons and Dragons. But now, Mike Carr was taking a portion of that for his adventure, and Gary realized that he could also get royalties from an adventure. So in a later printing of the basic set, I believe it was the seventh printing, uh, starting in early 1980, they replace um, In Search of the Unknown with B2 Keep on the Borderlands by Gary Gygax. So this does appear in later printings of Holmes Basic. OK, so that's 1977. Now, 1978, we have another game published, a box set, which is Gamma World. Now, this is published or, or written by a gentleman named Jim Ward. Now, Jim Ward had originally written this game for TSR back in 1976. This is just a small you know, booklet called Metamorphosis Alpha. So this is uh, TSR's first science fiction role-playing game. So Jim Ward writes this game. Of course, it's not a box set. I'm only mentioning it because mechanically and thematically, these two games are very, very similar. So this Metamorphosis Alpha and Game World are both based on the mechanics of original D&D. They use the same uh, six ability scores, except they separate strength into physical strength and then mental strength, which replaces wisdom. Okay, but this is a post-apocalyptic game. So this is a, all about themes of uh, having mutations. So the mutations in this kind of replace your spells, right? So your characters could be mutants and you could have all these different crazy powers like wings or scales or mental powers and things like that. So this box set came with, uh, well, it came with dice. Now these 
are, I think, a couple of the dice that came in. This this is not the original box set that I had for this game. I had a, a different box set. I mean, it's the same box set, but a different printing. And it was uh, something I bought from a friend back in very early 1980s, probably like 82 or 83, shortly after we began playing the game. And didn't realize it at the time. Uh, firstly, that box that I got, the other one, um, all the corners were covered with electrical tape, black electrical tape to hold the box together. And then the booklet, I didn't realize this, but the last, like, probably from about... Uh, I don't even remember exactly how far, but like there about a quarter of the book was missing and it was done in such a way that I didn't realize for years that I was missing part of the book. And so uh, I later went on um, in the early 2000s and found a decent copy of this game. Uh, the box is in really good shape. Um, I got this on eBay and they included these two dice. Now there would have been a full set of dice. I don't even know if these were the original dice that came in this box or not, but they were in there when I bought it off eBay. Now this adventure wouldn't have come in here, but what would have come in here was this map. So, uh, and it's, you know, it's basically the United States, but, um, you know, supposed to show that it's it's been damaged by by a nuclear war. So, uh, and the idea was this is, you know, these are all hexes. So you would key each hex and then mark down what was in that hex if the players were to explode there. So that is Gamma World 1978 uh box set so this was the second role-playing game that i ever played i was a huge fan of this game back in the day if you grew up in the 80s like i did kind of that threat of nuclear war was omnipresent and so having a game where you could kind of take those fears and then play them out by becoming a hero that's exposed to radiation it's very x-men like i guess in that way uh the radiation gives you superpowers um that's kind of what this game was like but in a in a far future again post-apocalyptic setting with this great cover by um david I think it's Trampier. It might be Trampier. I'm actually not sure how to pronounce his last name, unfortunately. So 1977, then 1970, or I'm sorry, 1978, then 1979, you have the release of this game. This is Boot Hill. And again, this is not my original copy. The original copy that I got back in the day, I, I bought it from a friend for, I think, a buck fifty. He charged me. Again, this would have been around 1982 or 83. Um, the box was just demolished. Like, the, the top was crushed. Um, and uh, and so I wanted to get a newer one, so I got this box set. And again, this box is in pretty decent shape for being how old this is. So this is 1979. And uh, so... Boot Hill was originally published in 1975 as a booklet game, uh, very similar to those small booklets that I showed you for original Dungeons and Dragons. And it was created by Gary Gygax and a guy named Brian Bloom. And it was done specifically because... Um, they did it in honor of Don Kay. Don Kay, you know, again, one of the original founders of Tactical Studies Rules with Gary Gygax, was a huge fan of Westerns and um, liked to play Western-style characters. And so um, they uh, they decided to um, to create this game kind of to honor Don Kay. Okay, so Brian Bloom met Gary Gygax at Gen Con uh, in Lake Geneva and... Um, he was a gamer. Okay. So he, he, uh, had grown up as a fan of history. He loved history and he also loved playing miniatures war games. Okay. So Don Kay and Gary Gygax each contributed a thousand dollars to help create tactical studies rules. And they wanted to publish Dungeons and Dragons, but a thousand dollars combined. So 2000 wasn't enough for them to get it printed. And so, uh, Brian Bloom approached them and, uh, offered up 2000 to become a partner in the company. So now they had $4,000, a thousand each from Gary and Don and the 2000 from Brian Bloom. And so with that $4,000, they were able to get the original thousand copies of Dungeons and Dragons printed. They also tried to publish another game ahead of time um, to make money that it called Cavaliers and Heads. That game didn't really take off. So D and D was really where they kind of made their bread and butter. So, 
um, Brian Bloom became part of the company. And then, uh, like very, very shortly thereafter, Don Cade passed away uh, very unexpectedly. And so for a while, his wife kind of took over his shares in the company. Um, but she just didn't have the bandwidth to kind of do the things that they needed her to do and wasn't really interested in it anyway. And so she, um, sold her shares eventually to Brian Bloom and to Brian Bloom's father, Melvin. And that was the creation of TSR Hobbies. Okay. And, and then Gary Gygax was also still part of that. Okay. At the time. So anyway, Brian Bloom is the guy that works on this. And he's kind of like the third guy from the original. Um, you know, it's, it's Guy Gax and Dave Arneson and then Brian Bloom, I guess kind of, you could think of that and Don Cape throw him in there too. It's just, he was involved for such a short time, unfortunately for passing away so early. Um, but he, Brian Bloom's the one nobody really talks about that much. And usually when they do, they do it in not so kind terms because he was one of the people that was involved in, um, making it available to oust Gary Gygax in the mid eighties. It's a huge complicated story. I'm not going to get into that. Okay. But um, anyway, this is Boot Hill Wild West role-playing game. Very, very light on the role-playing. It's really more of a player versus player shooting type game. We've talked about that a little bit before when I talked about the um, six ability scores in role-playing games, early role-playing games. So this is really more about fighting. It's a fighting game and creating characters and then figuring out who's better at shooting and fighting and and um, that kind of thing. So it came with this rule book. It would have come with dice. This one doesn't have any dice. It came with counters. So some of these were punched out already. Um, there's the counters and then it came with this map. The map is huge. It's not going to fit in the screen. This is just half of it. And then you can see the other half is over here. So, uh, again, with these hexes. So if you've ever heard of hex crawls, it's kind of how you do them is you have all these hexes on this map and then the DM or the referee in this case or the judge would would key each one of these hexes to say what's in it. And then if the players ever visit there, then he they know what's going to happen. OK, so. That is Boot Hill. Now, another kind of fun little thing about Jack Vance, or I'm sorry, about Brian Bloom. I just kind of blew the joke here about Brian Bloom. One of the things that he created for D&D was the character of Vecna, or he at least named Vecma, Vecna, and he named him as an anagram of the author Jack Vance, who, uh, as we know, was sort of the inspiration of, for the Vancing style magic that D&D uses. So that's where that name Vecna comes from. It's, a, it's an anagram of Jack Vance's last name. Uh, so I have a friend on Twitter whose son is a big fan of Vecma, so I thought maybe he would want to know that. Okay, so that's 1979. Now, also in 1979, you have the publication of the second edition. That is that is the second TSR edition of um, the Fight in the Skies game. So this is the second printing the, called the Orange Box, second printing of the Fight in the Skies game by TSR. Now, why do I keep bringing up Fight in the Skies when it's a war game? Well, it'll become obvious later, but I just want to bring it up because I know I'm confident that someone would say, oh, you forgot to include that, so I'm including it for that reason. Okay, then in 1980, we have the release of this game. This is Top Secret. This is the first espionage role-playing game that is published uh, by any role-playing game company. It uses a percentile system, which is also what Boot Hill used. So you're starting to see D&D outside of, of really um, Dungeons & Dragons and Metamorphosis Alpha and Gamma World and Empire of the Petal Throne, I guess, if you want to throw that in there. Those use that kind of traditional 3D6 on ability scores and uh, the variety of different dice available, all the different polyhedral dice. However, you with Boot Hill... And um, Top Secret, and we're going to get in some other games, they use percentile dice, okay? So this is a percentile system, and it included dice in this box, and it included, this is the rule book, and then it included a sample adventure that was called Operation, uh, I'm going to try to speak the best German I can, Operation Sprechenhaltestella, Okay. My box set does not have that adventure in it, and I I'll guess I'll just fess this up. So I, I was not always a, a law-abiding kid when I was young. But anyway, I went to the store, and um, I saw that um, there was a game for sale that I really wanted to buy, and uh, they it was um, missing it was missing one of the components inside the box set. I think it was missing the module. And so I went up to the guy at the store and I said, oh, excuse me, 
um, you're selling this game. And I just wanted you to know, like part of the components are missing. You have this box there. And I thought you'd want to know. I was trying to be a nice guy. And so he's like, oh, okay. And then later on, I go back to that store and I noticed that they put that box set for sale for half off. And so I thought, hang on a second. And so I'll make this as quick as I can. But I went to the store with my mom. This is like an apartment store. I think it was like Gemco or something. And I'm not proud of this, by the way. I'm just telling you because I'm priming context for how I have this game. So um, while she was looking at like the fabric and the sewing stuff, I was over at the rack looking at the the box set stuff. And um, over the course of what took about 20 minutes, I slit the um, plastic wrap that was on this box. I opened the box very carefully, keep making sure not to crinkle the plastic wrap. I took the module out, the one that it came with, and um, and then I took the dice out because I didn't need them. And I just put the book back in here. And I um, went to the guy at the store and I said, hey, I wanted to buy this. And it was the only one you have left. It wasn't. I'd hidden the other ones. And um, because I just didn't have a lot of money and I knew my mom wouldn't buy it because it was going to be $12. Right. Uh, I said, but so it's missing like half the components in here. It's like you can see it's supposed to have like these two books and this book's not in here. It doesn't have these dice. It's only got this. And I said, could you sell it to me for cheaper? Because I really wanted it. And he said, how about six dollars instead of 12, which is what I was hoping he was going to say. And I said, OK. And then I went to my mom and I convinced her to let me get this game, even though it had most of the components missing by saying that I was getting the rule book for $6 in this box. And with that, I could make my own adventures. So I didn't really need the adventure that was in here. And so she agreed and bought me this for $6. And then later on, a friend gave me this module, which is the second module, Operation Rapid Strike. So you can see it's TS002, whereas the other one was TS001. So um, that is my kind of nefarious story about how I came across having this box set. Um, it came with a character sheet that you see here. And then again, it would have dice. So uh, that is Top Secret 1980. Now, Top Secret was created by uh, a gentleman named Merle Rasmussen. We have talked about him before in conjunction with the Assassin class videos. Uh, but he developed the game while he was still in college at Iowa State University in 1975. And then the next year, he wrote to TSR to see if they'd be interested in publishing the game. And he was uh, it was reviewed by Mike Carr again. And uh, then he agreed to publish the game, or, you know, to look at. And then they assigned it to um, Alan Hammock to edit the game. But that was how this game came about from someone who was actually still in college. Funny story about this one is that um, as part of the play testing, they were printing out on um, imagine they were printing out things on TSR stationery about an imaginary assassination. And somehow that paperwork made it out uh, into the world and got into the hands of the FBI who came to investigate the offices of TSR because they had these, this paperwork about there's going to be an assassination, uh, which of course was fake. Another thing that's unique to this game is called fame and fortune points. Those are the first mechanics in a role-playing game that were published role-playing game mechanics that deal with players being able to alter game results, which is a big part of like storyteller games right now. Um, but that started all the way back with this 1980. Okay, that's 1980. So 1981 sees the release of this box set. This is a revision of a way of the Holmes basic DMD set. So this is basic. You see, it says it right here. So again, I have a whole video about this. Uh, this is the game, the very, the box that I started with. My mom gave this to me. I started playing in the fall of 1981, late fall. And I got this from my mom as an Easter gift in spring, uh, you know, Easter of 1982. And this is the exact set that I started with. I still have it all these years later. So the box is getting a little dinged up, but the book is in very, very good shape. So I also showed in that video, but just in case you haven't seen it, uh, I have my original dice that came with this box that I still have it. And you see, I never colored them in with the uh, crayons that came with it. So it came with, I think it was one of these white ones. Uh, and I never colored them in. Yeah, but that's my original dice that came with this box set that I still have. And then also in 1981, you would have had the release of uh, the box set for the expert set. Now, I never got the expert box. I just have the booklet. Okay, so they did sell these separately. Um, this box set came with that module B2, Keep on the Borderlands, in addition to the dice and then the rule book. Okay, so that was the box set. And then the expert set came with this and then module X1, Isle of Dread. Okay, which I do have. I just forgot to pull it off the shelf. Okay, um, I just keep my modules actually separate and then I keep my rule books 
in the box here. Okay, so that's 1981. Now also in 1981, you have the release of the Top Secret 2nd Edition. It's pretty much the same, just has um, rules errata that's clearing up uh, some things that had uh, they caught in the rules. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same game. It's just like, a, but you know, it's it, technically it's a 2nd Edition. So 1982, you have the release of this game. This is Gangbusters, so that's why I had the foreshadowing earlier. But this is a game about crime in the United States in the 1920s and 30s, and it's inspired by historical figures like Al Capone, but also TV shows and films on like The Untouchables, not the film that came much later in the 80s, um, like late 80s, uh, but like the TV show The Untouchables. So this is a percentile dice system, but it is a class and level system, and it has skills. So it came with a rule book, map, counters, and a 16-page introductory adventure, and then two D10s for the um, for the dice. So this was created by um, written by two individuals. One is Rick Krebs. So he uh, has someone who was creating simulation games with household items using things like toothpicks or plastic building blocks and cardboard chips, just whatever he could get his hands on. As as you know, as as a youngster. And then um, he created an RPG fanzine called Fanta Carta and is uh, credited in the preface to the 1977 first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. He's credited um, as coming up with some ideas in the preface. So he's been around for, for a while in the very, very early days. So he wrote early articles in Dragon Magazine on using um, electronic aids and also one about um, NPCs. So that's Rick Krebs. And then Mark Akers... Uh, I couldn't find too much about him as far as like his early life and things like that. He's very famous in the RPG community, but as far as finding out like kind of how he got into role playing games, I had a little trouble figuring that out. But uh, he did work um, with Rick on creating the Gangbusters game. But then shortly after Gangbusters was published, there was a huge, massive uh, mass exodus from TSR in the mid, uh, like early, like 83, 84 time period. Um, and about 200 people ended up leaving and it, there was layoffs, right? It was just a big, massive layoffs. There's a whole, there's books out there that you can read about like why this happened. I'm not going to get into that, but, um, Mark Akers was one of the people that left and he joined with a bunch of other staffers from TSR, you know, former staffers, and they ended up creating pace setter games. Now pace setter is probably best known for the horror game Chill. Uh, but they also had other games that I definitely remember seeing advertised in Dragon Magazine, like um, Star Ace specifically, but also Time Master and Sandman. So uh, that's Mark Akers. He, once Chill, or, I'm sorry, once uh, Pace Setter kind of uh, ceases operations, he ends up working for Mayfair Games. Uh, and we have talked about them before in uh, some of my earlier videos. So that's 1982. But also in 1982, you get the release of... This game, Star Frontiers. So this was TSR's entry into like, you know, not like Gamma World is more of what we would call science fantasy these days. So this was really their first kind of like hardcore science fiction role playing game. Although a lot of people would say this is this is like space opera. So it kind of just depends, but you know, they called it science fiction. Now my box here is pretty beat up. I did not own this game when I was a kid. I played it. I played a ton of this game as a kid, but I did not acquire this until probably about 20, 25 years ago off of eBay. So, um, but this is Star Frontier. So it, this one is interesting in that it is credited to the TSR staff. So um, that is the development here. It doesn't actually have authors' names. So uh, you see that here and um, up in here. So uh, that's unfortunate that we can't pick out specific individuals who worked on this. Um, but it came with uh, this booklet. This is the basic game. And then you see it has this expanded game. It's a much thicker rule book. Okay. So uh, it was um, edited uh, by... Um, Steve Winters. We're going to get to him in a little bit. And it's pretty much people think that, you know, at the very least, Lawrence Schick and Dave Zeb Cook probably worked on this. And we're going to talk about them again later as well. Uh, but you've got these two books. You've got this map in here, map booklet. This is sort of like the uh, adventure that came with it. So the crash on Volturnus. This one is by Mark Akers and Tom Moldvay 
with Doug Niles. Okay, so this one at least has credits in it. Okay, so the, um, the adventure, and then you have these counters. You see mine are unpunched. This was the map that I was talking about. And again, it's just too big to fit into the, the camera. But you can kind of get a sense of the map. Now, this is not a hex map. This is, these are uh, just squares, grids. Okay, and then this does have dice. So I don't know that these are, again, the original dice that came with this, because again, I bought this uh, secondhand off of eBay. So you do need percentile dice for this game. This is a percentile system. Um, but again, I'm not sure if these were the original dice or just stuck in there later. And then you have your... Um, entry form to join the role-playing game uh, gamer association. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And then our list of products that were available at the time from TSR. Okay, so that is Star Frontiers 1982. Now this was republished again in 1983 with a different cover called Star Frontiers Alpha Dawn, and it was done like that to match the trade dress of another game that came out. So we'll talk about that in just a second, okay? But also in uh, 1982, you have the release of this. This is Dawn Patrol. Now, technically, this is Fight in the Skies 7th edition. However, um, it was renamed as Dawn Patrol. Now, what's different about this game is that and it does include a little four-page folder that explains how you can convert playing this game from being a tactical aerial combat um, war game into a, a role-playing game. So it's got some light role-playing game rules that were put into this box set. I think that's partly why they changed the name from Fight in the Skies to Dawn Patrol. Okay, so that's why I talked about Fight in the Skies earlier, because they are all related. So they're all kind of the same game. It's just that this time they took the, the, the opportunity to include some role-playing game rules in the, in the box set. So still by Mike Carr. Now, a kind of just fun you know, thing about this, a little piece of trivia, Dawn Patrol or Fight in the Skies, however you want to look at it, is the only game that has been played at every single Gen Con every year since 1968. It's the only one. So um, I think that's kind of cool. You've got your rule book. It had charts and cards book. It had dice, maps, and counters. All right. Now, 1983, we had the release of the World of Greyhawk Fantasy Game Setting box set by Gary Gygax. I have talked about this before. So again, I'm not going to go into this. See my video here on the Greyhawk setting, and you'll see me open this up and show off some of the maps and the books and stuff that were included in this. But this is the first boxed setting that TSR published. Okay. Also in 1983, you have the release of this basic set. This is a very famous one. This um, art, at least, is something that you see everywhere. A lot of people from the 80s, if you think of, ask them to think of a piece of D&D art more than even the AD&D hardback book art, this is the art that comes to mind. So this is the basic set edited by Frank Mensner. Menser, sorry, I always screw up pronouncing his name. I don't know why. By Frank Menser. So um, this game came out, this is a revision to the Moldvay Basic that I showed you a little bit ago. Now, Frank was self-taught, uh, a self-taught D&D player, and he learned in the mid-70s, so very, very early on. And a friend encouraged him to answer an ad from TSR that was seeking a designer and an editor. And so he was hired after a phone interview with the folks at TSR, and then he actually started work there in 1980. So shortly after he started work there, there was a TSR, uh, what they called a DM Invitational. And it was to test, uh, a DM Invitational was to test Dungeon Masters to kind of figure out like who was the best. And so he beat everyone. He won, including people like Len Lakofka, we've talked about before. He beat Errol Otis, the artist, who was also a game designer and a DM. So he won everything. And after winning that, he was approached by Mike Carr, that name again, the Fight in the Skies Down Patrol guy, also B1 and Search the Unknown. So many other credits, it just those are the ones we've talked about so far today. So he approached Frank about starting the D&D, like a D&D fan club. And Frank was like, okay, that's cool, but I want to do something more with that. It's got to be more than just that. He wanted to encourage what he thought was like proper role playing, encouraging people to role play more, um, especially at conventions where they were being judged, because uh, I guess kind of the way that he thought of it was that people at conventions didn't necessarily, um, you know, 
you could win by sort of not contributing because you would just kind of like sneak by and you wouldn't necessarily get in trouble. And he wanted to encourage like, you know, get in trouble, meaning like make poor decisions for your character. Uh, and so he wanted to encourage people to talk more and to role play more. And so he turned this idea of a D&D fan club into the um, Role Playing Game Association. So the RPGA, which I showed you the entry form for that earlier. So in the 80s, pretty much every box set that you bought from TSR was going to include that um, entry form and envelope to, to join. Now, I sadly never did, um, which sucks. I wish I had of, in retrospect, but, you know, I just didn't. So as part of the RPGA, he wrote the first four RPGA adventures, R1 through R4, which were then later revised and republished in 1989 as the super module I-12 Egg of the Phoenix. So the reason that he created this particular version of the game, this basic set, uh, he was given the task by the TSR uh, ownership and executives of collating and revising the rules that had been published in TSR basic up to that line, up to that point. But also they wanted to make sure that he carefully avoided using any rules that had been specifically created for advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So remember these two games are being published simultaneously concurrently at the company and these people all talked to each other. They all gamed together and they needed to make sure for legal reasons. And there's, again, whole reasons for this. I'm not going to get into it now, but for legal reasons, they needed to be very clear that or they wanted it to be clear. At least that was their their position at the time that Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was a completely wholly separate game, completely unrelated to Dungeons and Dragons, this basic set here. So Frank's job was to make sure that he was avoiding anything from advanced D&D &D and, and having that accidentally sneak into a basic D&D &D line. So he was put in charge of this line. Um, so he ends up leaving uh, TSR in 1986 after Gary Gygax is ousted, and he actually works with Gary for a while at a company called New Infinities Productions, um, which lasts only a few years. And then after that company goes out of business, Frank leaves the game industry and then uh, he does for about two decades before he comes back. So I'm talking about some of these people that were involved in the early days of the game because a lot of times they just don't get a lot of mention. Now, Frank's probably an exception. A lot of people do know who he is. But the main people I keep talking about on the channel are Gary uh, Gygax and Dave Arneson. And I want to make sure I'm giving these other people credit and introducing you people to who they were and also like how they became involved. Why did they join the company or who did they know and what happened to get them to, to work there and sort of just a little bit about their careers. So 1983, you've got this basic set, but you also have the expert set also written by, you know, edited by Frank, uh, not edited, but written by Frank uh, Mensner. So you have Gamma World, Second edition. This comes out in 1983. This is a revision. It's by James Ward. We've already talked about him. Okay, so this is my box from back in the day. So this I did have this one and I bought it, uh, you know, new uh, when it came out. So this is the exact box. So it had this rule book, this great art. I think this is by Parkinson, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then uh, it had this adventure booklet. Now, these two modules didn't come in this. This is stuff I just stuck in there later uh, to make it easier. This referee screen is here. You've got the player character record sheets, which I bought separately, and then it came with this cool map. So this map is much more uh, you know, detailed than the one that was in the first edition box set. So um, kind of cool. All right. Now, another cool thing about this one is I also have my dice that came with this box set. So here they are. These are my Gamma World 2nd Edition dice. I still have them all these years later. All right, that's 1983. So really quick, a note about Jim Ward, who was the creator of Metamorphosis Alpha and also Gamma World. So he was one of the original people who was playtesting D&D and Gary Gygax's Greyhawk game prior to the publication of D&D. So he's been there since, you know, almost the very, very beginning. So, uh, and he ended up working at TSR all the way up through, I think it was 1996. So over 20 years that he worked there. So uh, he very famously, if I remember the story correctly, uh, he was a VP at the time in 1996, and he decided to resign rather than um, basically have management make him lay people off, which he did not want to do. And so um, by resigning, he I think he was thinking that he could, um, you know, save, you know, at least, hit, you know, a, a couple of maybe a job or, or two, you know, by, by doing that. Um, it was a, a tough time at TSR in, in the kind of mid to late 90s uh, before um, Wizards of the Coast finally purchased them. So 
Um, sorry, that's a little bit about James Ward. So that is 1983. So now also 1983, you have the release of Star Frontier's Nighthawks. So this addressed a problem that um, a lot of people had with Star Frontiers early on, which is that it didn't have ship combat rules. So um, that was dealt with in this particular game that's all about spaceship combat in the Star Frontiers kind of um, you know environment, that setting. So uh, it has counters, dice, a map, and it did have an adventure in here, uh, SFKH, so Star Frontiers Nighthawks Zero, Warriors of White Light. So this game was designed by Douglas Niles, and it was edited by Steve Winter. So I'm just going to deal with Douglas Niles by now. Steve Winter is going to come up again. Um, but Douglas Niles is from Wisconsin, loved heroic fantasy as a kid, and he began to teach English at a high school near Lake Geneva. And one of his students was Heidi Gygax, daughter of Gary. And she came to him and said, hey, I need to be excused from school tomorrow. I'm being interviewed by People Magazine. And he was like, why is that? And she said, well, my dad invented this game called Dungeons and Dragons. And Douglas had heard of it, but didn't realize that the people that created that game lived so close to him. And that the guy's daughter, the, one of the creator's daughters was in his class, Heidi Gygax. So... Uh, she ends up going home and bringing back to school a, a basic box set for Douglas to learn how to play, which he does. And a few days later, he starts DMing his own game. So uh, one of his players in that game ends up working at Dragon Magazine. And then he tells Douglas that there is an editorial position available at TSR, which Douglas applied for. And he failed that editor test. Um, but instead, he goes on to apply for a game design job. And uh, he eventually does get hired. And he was given a brief for this module to write adventure, um, which he ends up completing in four weeks. And it becomes module N1. Uh, once again, I forgot to pull it off my shelf. I do have this in my collection. But this is the classic um, module for starting level characters in advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So sort of like B1 and B2 are, are the um, standards for basic D&D, learning how to play that version of the game, the non-advanced version. N1 was kind of the classic Either that or T1 Village of Hamlet were kind of considered the two that you would look at in, in an advanced game to learn how to play. So he writes that in only like four weeks and everyone's pretty happy with that. And so he starts to get more and more work. So in addition to working on Star Frontiers Nighthawks, he also became very, very involved with Dragonlance from the very, very beginning almost. So um, he was he's, he wrote a lot of modules for Dragonlance, but also um, novels. So he's one of the most prolific novel writers in the Dragonlance, um, you know, milieu, uh, if you call it that. And then he also wrote um, the what ended up becoming the Moonshade trilogy for the Forgotten Realms. So he wasn't writing it to be Forgotten Realms. He was just doing like some Celtic themed books, but they ended up kind of retconning them and putting them into the Forgotten Realms. And it becomes the Moonshade trilogy, which is the famous trilogy from the uh, late 80s with Forgotten Realms. And then he also authored the Dungeoneer's Survival Guide in 1986, and his name's going to come up later, all right? So he left TSR in 1990 to focus on writing fantasy fiction. Also in 1983, this is where I was talking about, um, you have sort of this revision of Star Frontiers. So the rules are exactly the same. They just changed the trade dressing. It's now called Star Frontiers Alpha Dawn, and they just changed the packaging so that it um, matched the Nighthawks packaging so you could tell that the two games were related. So um, that is Star Frontiers Alpha Dawn. All right, now, 1984, you have the release of the uh, Menser uh, Companion set for uh, that game line. So this is going to cover levels 15 through 25. Uh, I believe it was 15 through 25, yeah. So um, that is the Companion set. Now, you also, in 1984, have the release of this. One of my favorite games. This is Marvel Superheroes, 1984. Okay, so uh, this was um, uses percentile dice for results, and it's compared on a column uh, so that you can figure out what your uh, results are going to be. So this is called the Universal Table. It's later returned as the Action Control Table. But this this kind of table here becomes 
ubiquitous among TSR games in sort of the post-84 period up until about 1989-ish or so. Um, many games are even rewritten. So um, Top Secret is rewritten to use this, as is Gamma World and some other games to use this particular system. Okay, so this that's the action control system. So you've got your book. Now I have all my notes and stuff in here because I, I played this game a lot. So I've got my characters that I created and my drawing of them. Uh, but here you've got your battle book, and then you've got your uh, one of your first adventures, the breeder bombs. Okay, and then you've got your little character cards that have all their stats and stuff here. And then uh, there was this was the adventure that was actually included in the box set, Day of the Octopus. And then you've got your map here. Got your role playing game association uh, entry form, and then you have your counters, which I did punch. You do have your percentile dice. So these are the dice that came in this box. Never taken them out. So, again, just a quick look at this map. Okay, so the interesting story on this is when I saw this game advertised in Dragon Magazine, I really, really wanted it. I, I was very excited about getting it. And so um, I, uh, I, I wanted to, to buy it, but the thing was, I wasn't reading comic books at the time. So I started reading comics in 1977 with uh, Marvel Star Wars comics, but I stopped reading at issue 15. So, uh, you know, and the, and the original movies only check up the first six issues, and then Marvel goes off on their own forever until Empire Strikes comes Empire Strikes Back comes out. And so they write their own kind of continuity, uh, which are really fun. But anyway, I had read those, but I stopped reading them. So when I saw this game coming out, I was like, I really want to play this. But really, the only character I knew was Spider-Man. So, I, I mean, by name, I could probably have named Cap and Thing. Um, I had no idea who this was. This is a new Captain Marvel, um, later known as Photon. But this is Monica Rambeau. If you watch like the, the, the Disney, um, uh, you know, any of the Disney MCU movies, that's Monica Rambeau right there. But anyway, I didn't know who she was. I, and I was like this. And also this adventure that came in here, the breeder bombs, which features um, the X-Men. I had no idea who any of these people were. And I saw this adventure being advertised and I was like, uh Oh, so um, I went to my local mall and went to the Walden books. And I asked my mom if I could buy uh, an X-Men comic which I ended up getting X-Men number 197. And that was the comic that got me started back into collecting comics, which I'm still reading today. So um, I publish shorts every week where I talk about the comics that I'm picking up. That comic kind of bug hit me when this game came out and with me picking up X-Men number 197. All right. So this game is, uh, again, it uses percentile dice. They call it the face rip system. I've talked a little bit about that before in my video on the six ability scores of D&D &D and comparing ability scores from other games. It's created by Jeff Grubb. So Jeff Grubb was a war gamer in high school in Pittsburgh, mainly playing stuff like Panzer Blitz and Blitzkrieg, like, you know, World War II war games. Um, but he learns D&D &D as a freshman in, in uh, school. And then he goes to Gen Con later that same year that he learned to play D&D. &D, and he began um, running games in his home world of, and I'm, I think it's Toril. I know Forgotten Realms fans are going to attack me, but Toril, T-O-R-I-L, was the original name of Jeff Grubb's world. And it was grafted onto the Forgotten Realms later. So it, the Forgotten Realms world, planet world of Toril took its name from Jeff Grubb's home campaign. Okay, so... Um, uh, but he uh, begins to oversee uh, the design of the D&D Open at Gen Con in 1982. And that leads to him becoming an employee of TSR because he did such a good job. They really liked the way that he handled that. So he worked on Dragonlance. Probably most famously, other than this, he wrote Manual of the Plains um, for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So I have a video on that where you see that book. Um, there's a link here. But he also worked on Spelljammer, El Kadim. Uh, for second edition and AD&D. &D. And then he was responsible. He's the guy that's responsible for contacting Ed Greenwood and having Ed um, send him his notes that eventually became the Forgotten Realms setting owned by TSR. Ted basically sells it to them. So um, he also authored books and comics, including issues of the AD&D &D Advanced Dungeons and Dragons comic and the Forgotten Realms comics for DC Comics. And then he worked on video games later in his career as a world builder and writer. And uh, his name is also going to come up later. So he leaves TSR in 1994 for freelance work. 
But uh, Wizards of the Coast brings him back as a freelancer, and he works on a lot of stuff uh, in third edition. So, um, and other D20 products. Okay, so that's Jeff Grubb, very famous guy in role-playing game industry. And he is still with us, as is Jim Ward, as is Douglas Niles. So a lot of these guys are still around, which is kind of cool. And they, you will see them pop up on, you know, they've got blogs, or you'll see them pop up on social media and stuff where you can actually interact with them. And uh, I think that's really neat that, that these guys are still around and still active. Okay, so the other person that worked on this, Jeff Grubb was the designer. The person who wrote this was Steve Winter. So we talked about Steve Winter before. Usually more we think of him as an editor at TSR, but uh, he did do writing, and so he wrote this. Now, Steve was born in Iowa, and he discovered Tolkien in high school, Lord of the Rings and that kind of thing. Uh, He worked at a department store that sold war games, and so he got involved in war games through that, like seeing them for sale. And so he joined a a game club for the war games, but then those people taught him about D&D, which he really responded to. So he began his career as a journalist at at a local paper, but then uh, he was let go, laid off, and uh, he was looking for a job. And uh, he saw an ad being offered for an editor position at Dragon Magazine, and he applied for that job. And he started as an editor in 1981 and edited many of the games that we've just talked about. So Star Frontiers, Gangbusters, The World of Greyhawk box set, like all of those were edited by Steve Winter. Okay, so um, and then he worked on many other products for D&D and AD&D, as well as uh, working on third edition. Okay, so he leaves Wizards of the Coast in 2011. So he was there for a really long time, crossing between um, TSR and Wizards of the Coast. All right. So uh, as an aside for me personally, I had the pleasure of, you know, working with Steve. Um, uh, I think it was the first year I was asked to be a judge at the One Page Dungeon Contest. Uh, Steve was a fellow judge and I actually um, interviewed him online to talk a little bit about his like a uh, judging process. There's a, a blog post that I wrote about that. So um, I can link to that in the show notes below if that's of interest to you. All right. So that's 1985. Now, uh, I'm sorry, 1984. Also 1984, you have the release of this game, Indiana Jones. So this is a percentile system. It is uses the action control table. Uh, the same one from Marvel Superheroes RPG. It's, you know, it's modified a little bit, but this table, again, became used for so many games at TSR during this time period. So uh, obviously TSR acquired the license from Lucasfilm. They, Lucas, this is pre, you know, Disney sales. So this was owned by Lucasfilm at the time, uh, uh, Indiana Jones was. So because of that, Lucasfilm acquisition, you know, acquiring the license from Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm got to had a lot of say in how this game worked, and they very famously did not want character creation rules in the game. That that was their decision. So this game is famous for not having character creation rules, and so because of that, I think it just didn't sell as well as it could have because you were required to use pre gen characters unless you kind of read between the lines because there are very substantial rules in this book for creating non player characters, and the person who designed this, which is Dave Cook. He um, he was hoping that people would figure that out and would realize that the that the really robust NPC creation rules were there for a reason, and it was to create your own characters. Um, but for whatever reason, this game just did not sell well at all. Despite you know, Indiana Jones was super popular at at the time, um, and they don't, you know the first two movies had already come out when this was created. So um, it's very rules light. It's got fast gameplay. It comes with a rule book an evidence file, a map, a referee screen. It had these cardboard fold-out figures. They called them 3D, um, but uh, you know they're just little cardboard standy figures. And then it came with percentile dice with crayon. Okay, and um, so that is uh, that is this particular game. Now, what's kind of fun about this one as well is that the um, adventure that's included in the main rule book. So there's an adventure that you kind of follow along, and it was called the Icons of, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to say Ica, Icamanin, 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 I'm not sure, in whatever case. Uh, that adventure was actually the first part of the future adventures uh, the further adventures of indiana jones comic book published by marvel marvel comics and that adventure was written and illustrated by john byrne in the comic book and then they adapted it for this box set so he's actually credited as a designer on this game for creating the framework of that adventure uh, famous marvel comics artist john byrne now 
Steve Cook, we've talked about many times on the channel as far as like his design credits and things like that. So yeah, he worked on this Indiana Jones game. So I'm not going to get too much more into him. You can watch some of my other videos. Um, he's done enough that you could probably have a video just for himself if we really wanted to do that. Okay. So now we're going to get to 1985 and we have the release of this box set. This is Battle System. So uh, it, they said that it was really sort of like a successor to the Chainmail Miniature War Games rules. So this is a mass battle combat system rule set. And what's kind of unique about it is that it's designed so that it could work with either advanced Dungeons & Dragons, but it could also work with the non-advanced Dungeons & Dragons line, which again, at the time back in the day, we just colloquial, colloquially called it basic D&D. There was advanced D&D and there was basic. Now, um, I know it's technically just D&D, but we called it basic D&D to distinguish it from advanced. So this box set came with a rule book, a scenario book, miniatures guides, player aids cards, had two metal miniature generals for your main characters that you would use, but then it also had some 3D cardboard fold-up figures and army roster sheets. It had die cut counters. Um, it does not require having a DM but they do suggest in the rules that you have a referee of sorts for certain types of battles, especially when you get into ones that involve using magic, um, things like invisibility and things like that, that might require a third party to arbitrate like how, how that rule would be implemented. So this is designed by Douglas Niles. We've already talked about him and Steve Winter. We've already talked about him. So that's 1985 battle system. Then also in 1985, you have the release of the master set for the um, Menser uh, basic D&D line. So that Beck Me line, we've talked about that before in the editions of D&D video. So master set covering levels 26 through 36, might be 25 through 36. I forget what the cutoffs are off the top of my head, but that's 1985. And then you also have the release of the Conan role-playing game. So interestingly, uh, in, earlier in the 80s, TSR had licensed and published these adventures, Conan Unchained and Conan Against Darkness, uh, based on the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, obviously. So these were modules that were written for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. These were pretty popular at the time. And so they took the extra step of then licensing the Conan property to create a, their, its own role playing game. So uh, the, they, uh, this was designed by our friend Dave Zebcook, uh, just he was a machine back in the day. So it does use that action control table that we talked about with, um, you know, first debuting with Marvel superheroes back in 84. And it came with a rule book, a book of talents, weaknesses, and charts. And then it had a notebook about the land of Hyboria. And it came with percentile dice. So that's 1985. Now let's get to 1986, and we have the Menser Immortals set. So this covers what happens to your characters once they ascend beyond character level. So past 36 level, they kind of they become immortals, kind of the equivalent of gods in the you know non-advanced D and D world. Okay, so you also have the release of Gamma World Third Edition. This is still written and created by Jim Ward. Um, so, uh, but it is. Um, uh, uses the action control table. So we've changed the mechanics now to fall into that percentile system that um, Marvel superheroes was using. So one quick word about um, about Jim Ward, because I keep forgetting to bring this up, but if you were a player of fifth edition and um, you've seen the spell Dromage's Instant Summons, which is a six level wizard spell, that spell is named after Jim Ward's character Dromage, which if you just look at that, that's just Jim Ward's backwards. Okay, so um, that was his name backward. That was his character. So uh, again, I was mentioned that he's been involved in the game from the very, very beginning. So there's a whole spell named after one of his characters. So uh, that's Gamma World 3rd Edition. And then you have Marvel Super Heroes Role Playing Game Advanced Game. So this kind of uses the same mechanical structure of the original Marvel Super Heroes game that we saw before, that yellow box that I showed, but it expands it. Um, and it, it does use that universal table, but then they expand the results of the universal table to cover a wider variety of results. Combat is much more complex. There's more magic. There's more magical powers. There are better weapons. There's more vehicles. Everything is just more in this particular game. So it had a main rule book and a judge's book. It had a new map. It had more character stat cards, and it had uh, more 3D of fold-up characters in this particular game. So that's 1986. Then in 1986, you see the release of the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. 
So this is created by Ed Greenwood and Jeff Grubb. We've talked about Jeff Grubb already. So the box set consists of two books, a Dungeon Master's source book and then a Cyclopedia of the Realms. And it had four maps. And Ed Greenwood, uh, basically the way that this worked was after Jeff Grubb had approached Ed and asked him like, hey, you're writing all these articles in Dragon Magazine that mention this world that it seems like you call it the Forgotten Realms. And Ed had been writing articles in Dragon Magazine, like going back to some of the very earliest issues. And he was always doing world building these articles. And it, the editors at, at Dragon Magazine started to see like, I think this guy's got something here that's more than just him writing this article. And Ed said kind of like, yes, I, I do have a world for this. And um, very famously, the question was, and I'm going to paraphrase, but the question was, are you making this up as you go along? Or do you have this all pre-planned and you have a whole world there? And Ed answered, yes. And yes, because to both, he's making it up as he goes along, but he does have this whole world. So Jeff Grubb approached him about acquiring this world for TSR. This would be around the time that Gary Gygax is being ousted from the company. Um, again, whole reasons for that. That's, that's a whole different video, or there's other people that have covered that better than I ever could. Um, but he owned Greyhawk. And so TSR was looking for, um, I mean, now, now TSR owned Greyhawk, that, but it was still Gary's world, had Gary's stamp on it. So TSR is looking for a way to kind of break away from Greyhawk and do something different. So they uh, approached, Jeff Grubb approached Ed Greenwood about getting this world. So Ed starts just sending boxes and boxes. There's these famous stories about all this material that showed up and Ed like triple wrapped it with all kinds of stuff. He was very careful about not wanting it to get damaged. And um, all these notes and maps and documents. And I think some of it was even left, like floppy disks for computers and stuff like that. So he sent all this. Jeff Grubb goes through it all. And then Jeff ends up, um, uh, you know, basically collating it, organizing it and kind of writing it and writing the campaign saying. So it's Ed's world. But Jeff did so much work to make this come to life. So this is the Forgotten Realms campaign saying this is the first um, version of that that you see here in 1987. So uh, also in 1987, we have the release of Top Secret SI. Okay, so this is a um, new version of Top Secret. So, um, and I just forgot what SI stands for. I want to say like special, I know it's special something and forgive me, I, I forgot what it stands for. I'll put a note up here. Um, but this is designed by Douglas Niles. Again, we've talked about him. I told you his name was going to keep coming up. So this one has a little bit more of like a structured background to it. So um, the characters in this work for a special intelligence agency fictional called Orion. And um, they are going up against like their nemesis agency that's called Web. So this box set includes a player's guide, an administrator's guide, settings and scenario booklet, equipment and inventory booklet, a map, cutout figures and sheets, and administrator's screen and dice. So you're seeing as we go along that these box sets that were very, very simple in the beginning of the games where it would include like maybe a booklet and a map and, and, and dice or, or chits as the case may be. Um, as, as they go along and we get into the like the mid to late 80s, they, they're really blowing out all the stops with these, you know, including, you know, these fold up counter figures that, you know, for, for like 3D miniatures almost, but, you know, made out of paper, cardboard. Um, but all these different booklets and maps and cards and charts and all this stuff, they're really taking advantage of that box set format. So you'll also notice, by the way, that you're not seeing box sets for advanced Dungeon Dragons other than that World of Greyhawk set that I showed back in 1983. We haven't seen another advanced D&D box set yet. All the box sets we've been seeing are for the non-advanced line. And that was a way of partially of differentiating the two. AD&D really went down the hardback game book route starting in 1977 with that monster manual. And and basic D&D did not have hardback books until 1991 with the release of the Rules Cyclopedia. So that was just another way where you could tell like the two games were separate. Okay, so uh, that's 1987. Also 1987, I'm just going to talk about super briefly. You have Gamma Rotters, which is a board game, but there was a um, concurrent comic book that was published by DC Comics using the Gamma Rotters license. And in the comic book, they actually include um, some rules for like a micro RPG system to play Gamma Rotters. However, that wasn't published in this box set. So that's why I'm not really talking about it too much, but it was kind of somewhat related to um, uh, like you're playing like kind of, you know, crazy mutant animal type things. 
Okay, so 1988, this is going to be our last year of things that we're going to talk about. So we have the release of the City System Accessory. Now, this is for Advanced D&D. It's also for Forgotten Realms. Okay, and it uh, is by Jeff Grubb and Ed Greenwood. We've already talked about them. And it's extensive and detailed maps for the City of Waterdeep in the Forgotten Realms. So it's got 12 large detailed maps and 10 of them actually connect together to show this really complex system of alleys and buildings and all this kind of stuff, uh, rooftops in the city of Waterdeep. And then um, it's got a booklet of essays and it's got charts and tables and things like that. So this is a very detailed city boxed set. You also have the release of Caratour, the Eastern Realms campaign setting. So this is for um, it, it, it comes for, it, it, it ends up being part of the Forgotten Realms. It wasn't designed that way originally. So originally in 1985, TSR published um, for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, Oriental Adventures. And in it, there is a section in the back for a campaign setting, like a mini setting called Caratour. It featured four nations. So this box set takes those four nations, expands it up to a total of 10 nations and uh, geographical areas and slots it into the Forgotten Realms, which it wasn't originally intended for. Um, neither the Forgotten Realms had this in there and it wasn't, this wasn't created to be part of the Forgotten Realms, but they throw it all in there together. So um, it has two books, it had four maps, it had two plastic overlays. So this one has numerous authors in it. I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, Mike Pondsmith worked on this. Uh, he had designed games as a child he was introduced to D&D in college. He had a lot of naval wargaming experience. So when, when he got introduced to D&D, he liked the mechanics. He liked the idea, but not so much the fantasy elements of it. Um, he ends up being intrigued by Traveler. He likes the idea of a science fiction role-playing game. So, But he didn't like the mechanics of Traveler. So he kind of creates his own game. Um, later on, he, he ends up working as a graphic designer in the video game industry. He creates a game called Mechtang, which is a mecha tactical war game in 84, which is then later redesigned to make it into a role-playing game. And he founds a game company called R. Talsorian Games. Um, most famously, I think you'd know Mike Pondsmith for creating Cyberpunk and also Castle Falkenstein. So those are his games. Um, Cyberpunk 2020, I think, is a popular game, but it, its roots are in this game that Mike Pondsmith created way back in the 80s. So he works on this game. Uh, or this box set, Cartoor Eastern Realms. Also, Jay Batista. I couldn't find a ton of info about Jay, but he did write adventures for both, uh, for first edition, including some Dragonlance adventures. And he worked on this um, second edition, Advanced D&D Monstrous Compendium. And he wrote adventures for Dungeon Magazine. Also, Rick Swan worked on this. He worked from at TSR from around 89 until about 1995. Uh, he wrote a lot of second edition products like the Complete Paladin, Complete Barbarian, Complete Wizard, Complete Ranger, those like splat books that came out with Advanced D&D second edition. And then he wrote a book called The Complete Guide to Role-Playing Games, like a set not, not published by TSR. John Nephew also worked on this product. Uh, he began freelancing at TSR while he was still in high school. He was writing material for both Dragon Magazine and its sister publication, Dungeon Ma uh, Magazine. And he was invited to contribute to uh, the Car Tour box set. And later in college, uh, he met Jonathan Tweet. Uh, Jonathan Tweet worked on third edition D&D, helped design that system, and also later the 13th Age role-playing game. Uh, but at the time, he was at Line Rampant Games, who were the original publishers of the game Ars Magica role-playing game. And then later, John Nephew founds Atlas Games. And then uh, lastly is Deborah, I'm going to butcher this, I hope not, Taramis, Taramis Christian. She's a U.S. Army vet, but she's an author, and she also worked as a designer and editor on many TSR products, such as the um, Minrithad Guild's Gazetteer for the Dawn Advanced D&D line. So that is this particular box set, the uh, Carator Eastern Realms campaign setting. Also in 1988, you have the release of the Buck Rogers Battle for the 20th, 25th Century game. This is a board game. It's not a, it's not a role-playing game. It's a board game. However, there is a role-playing game that comes out of this in 1990. So both of these are kind of beyond our scope because the role-playing game is pushing our, our window of cutoff of 1988. And this is a um, board game. Uh, but it just, this board game didn't really sell very, very well. So I just mentioned it because it does have a related sister game that is a role playing game that's published in 1990. Then you have the Bullwinkle and Rocky role playing party game. This one uses spinners, not dice. And, uh, it has story cards. It has puppets. Lawrence Schick says that it barely, barely qualifies as a role playing game. 
So it's designed by Dave Zeb Cook and Warren Spector. Now, Warren Spector was born in Manhattan, but went to college in Illinois. He was playing war games. He got introduced to D&D by some science fiction writer friends of his. And in 1983, he was looking for a job and he was contacted by a friend who was an editor at Space Gamer Magazine, which was published by Steve Jackson Games. And it was a game, it was a magazine that covered science fiction and fantasy board games and role-playing games. So he applies for a job there as an editor. And shortly thereafter, he becomes the editor-in-chief of Steve Jackson games, like all of their stuff. So um, so while Warren is at Steve Jackson games, his high school friend, another game designer by the name of Greg Kostikian, uh, developed a game called Tomb. It was actually based on an idea by a role-playing game artist and game designer, Jeff D, who I talked about just recently on my video on early tabletop role-playing game play aids. And so Greg developed this game and he intended it to just kind of be an article, like a, a one-off short little uh, article about this goofy cartoon based role-playing game, but Warren kind of saw potential. And so he takes it and recrafts it to become a full role-playing game, which ends up being the first role-playing game published by Steve Jackson Games. And I think it was 1984 that that came out. So uh, he also worked on the game Paranoia and on GURPS. And so he was hired by TSR in March of 1987. And he worked on Marvel superheroes. He worked on Top Secret SI. He worked on some novels, uh, Choose Your Own Adventure books. And then he also worked on second edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Um, but he left in 1989 to join the video game industry, where he's become very well known within that, within those quarters. So um, he worked on various Ultima games. He worked on Wing Commander, a bunch of other stuff. I'm not going to list it all. But anyway, it's it, it makes sense when she realized that like he was the guy that was sort of responsible with Greg Kostikian of creating Tune for Steve Jackson games, that he created this um, Bullwinkle and Rocky role-playing game, uh, party game for TSR. So role-playing games kind of like in quotes, Lawrence Schick said it barely qualifies as an RPG when he reviewed it in his book, Heroic Worlds, about the history of role-playing game books. Um, but I put it in here because it was a box game that was published as a role-playing game by TSR prior to 1988 or 1988 or before. So the last one I'm going to cover is this is a top secret SI adventure or a companion set. It's called High Stakes Gamble. So this is a game accessory that details the city of Monte Carlo as well as vehicle racing rules. So it has a whole booklet just on the city of Monte Carlo, on gambling, on that kind of thing. And then it has another booklet on Grand Prix racing, uh, very specifically the Grand Prix racing that would be held in Monte Carlo. But it also has advanced vehicle rules for, you know, everything from cars to planes is in this particular book. And then it has a campaign book that has scenarios and two complete adventures in it. it has a map it has vehicle cards with stats so this game was designed or this you know companion accessory was designed by our friend douglas niles we've talked about and another gentleman by the name of robert kern now again i couldn't find a ton online about robert kern uh, i do know that he wrote reviews of different role-playing games in um, various early tabletop role-playing game magazines and he did, he worked on the 007 role-playing game uh, which so it makes sense that he worked on this game as well. And then he also worked on a little bit on West End Games Star Wars, like the D6 system of Star Wars. So that is um, Robert Kern. And that is going to bring us to the end of this video. So uh, I had to start and stop a few different times. I had to try to get some more light in here. Uh, I hope that the audio is going to work out okay. I know sometimes when I mix different videos and mash them together, the audio is not consistent. I try as hard as I can to, to make it consistent. I don't know how to edit it to make it that way. So if you have tips or suggestions on making that better, go ahead and throw them into the comments uh, below. And also let me know if you enjoyed this video. And if you did, if you could please like it, I would appreciate it. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, if you could subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends to help me keep growing, I would really, really appreciate it. So uh, again, leave in your comments below if you wanna see any more details on any of these um, different uh, systems that we talked about here today, these different box sets. Also below, you'll find places where you can join me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm also now on Blue Sky if anybody's there. Um, so uh, I love uh, you know interacting with people so you can chat with me there. Uh, if you have, pictures of your own box sets that you uh, have and want to show me that you can do that. Just tag me, post, you know, post it on there and tag me and let me, let me see it. Let me see what you have. Um, 
And uh, also below, you'll find a link where you can support my channel by buying something from my shop. So you can buy a t-shirt, hoodie, poster, mug, items like that featuring a bunch of different designs that I had created, especially for my channel. So this is the only place where you can find these specific versions of these designs. And that's the best way where you can help me out. So I am hoping to upgrade my camera equipment. And um, that is something that, you know, would help go a long way uh, if you could buy a little something from the shop to help support that. Um, so uh, with that, I want to say thank you very, very much for watching this video. Happy gaming. Stay safe. And I'll talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking and what I was listening to while I was making my notes for this video. There were a ton of notes that I had to make on this one. So uh, I kept myself company with a little of this. This is Whistle Pig Old World Cask Finished Rye bespoke blend, whatever. A lot of this is just marketing terms, but uh, this is uh, aged 12 years. I love rye whiskey. Um, probably as much as bourbon. Uh, just kind of depends on my mood. But anyway, I just had a little bit here. I'm just drinking this neat. It's got that rice spice, but a little bit of sweetness from the, um, from the cask aging. So um, I was listening to The Clash, London Calling, 1979. This is a first uh, pressing in stereo. Classic punk album. Uh, I've loved this music since you know, I was a kid kind of um, when I first heard it. And uh, I, it's, you know, it's just something everyone should have in their vinyl collection, I think. So um, that's it. And thanks again. And I'll talk to you next time.